Welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm so excited to have you join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs in the photography industry as we discuss photography, building a business, and still having a life through it all. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom post-production for the wedding and portrait photographer. And now, let's dive into conversation. All right, guys, so the format for the podcast this week is slightly different. First of all, I'm sitting on the floor of my bedroom, and my son is actually sitting next to me. He is going to interview me, thanks to many questions from a number of you out there, Brad, Jason, Jill, Rebecca, Sean, thanks for sending questions uh, my way. You're going to get to know a little bit about me. Normally, I'm asking the questions but instead, Austin is going to ask these questions. Thanks, Austin, for helping me out with this today. No problem. I'm excited to, to see how you do this. Now, Austin is uh, Austin knows me way too well and may at some point probably start to laugh at me if I begin to sound too formal. And, and this is allowed. That's good. You can kind of break it up. I actually, uh, I will admit, I earlier today tried to record a self-interview and basically read through the questions and answer them myself. And I found myself just rambling on way too much. And I really didn't like the, the feel of, of, of the recording. So Austin was gracious enough, uh, cool, sorry, cool enough to use the lingo. <laughs> exactly help me out. You can probably update the lingo as we go. But anyway, Austin's going to answer que- or ask questions and I'll respond. And we're just going to keep it that simple. Austin, by the way, tell us about yourself, Austin. Uh, how old are you? I'm 14, I think, and just entered ninth grade, (laughs) so first year of high school. How's that working out for you? Pretty good so far. It's really fun. Uh, Marching band is definitely the most fun and most stressful thing out of of all the classes that I have. Simultaneously, the most fun and most stressful. The thing I look most forward to and the thing that takes the most work. Okay. I love it. So you're not afraid of hard work? Yeah. Well, I mean, sure. It's a good sign. Does that speak well of me as a father? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we've got a list of questions here. We're going to go through them. I'm going to keep this to the, the 30, 35 minutes or so that uh, I normally try to keep this format to. Uh, we'll go through as many of these questions as we can, but I'm going to let you take over now. You're the boss. I'm going to start, stop rambling. I'm already doing it. Go to town. Okay. Uh, so our opener, uh, where are you originally from? Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm originally from Kokomo, Indiana. So you guys may, well, most of you probably know where Indianapolis is. Kokomo is about an hour away from there and happens to be home to Clifford the Big Red Dog. Did you know that? Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, actually, the author of Clifford, I don't even remember his name, but the author of Clifford the Big Red Dog is originally from Kokomo, Indiana. That's that's pretty great. Trivia for the day. (laughs) Uh, but my parents, what I really, one of the things I really love about my childhood, my parents recorded audio. Of course, back then, back in the day, long, long time ago, it was about tapes, right? We would actually record on tapes. So I really want to play, I, I told you earlier that I was going to do this. I want to play just a clip here of audio from a conversation between myself, I was one at the time, <laughs> and my mom. So here it goes. Where do you live? At Kokomo. Kokomo, oh. And when is your birthday? I guess. And where do you like to eat? Wendy's. Wendy's? And what do you eat at Wendy's? What do you eat at Wendy's? And pop. Pop? What else do you eat? A cat and a cat and a cup What What else do you eat at Wendy's? And a pop. And ham. Burger. Hamburger? Nathan, where's cousin? That, that, the Africa. Africa? Oh, that's nice. And how did cousin get to Africa? He went on a what? Airplane. On an airplane. Oh, that's nice. And whose house do you go to when you cut, mow the lawn, mow the grass? I my grass. Where do you mow the grass? Grandpa's house. At Grandpa's house? Yes. And what do you do with Grandma? My cake. My cake in the sand. In oh, the sandbox. That's nice. Uh-huh. And who's on the floor? Uh-huh. Who's on the floor? Jason. Jason. Is he a, your brother? Yes. Is he chewing on the shoes? Yes. Uh-huh. What else does he do? Uh, the egg pop. 
Oh, he's not going to Africa. Where are you going? Um, the Africa. No. Where are you going? Um, the Japan. Japan. Oh, good. Nathan, how old are you? Ran. And when is your birthday? I can get August. August? How old will you be in August? I ran so. <laughs> Two. All right, so apparently I was obsessed with Africa, but that gives you a little bit of insight into the beginning of the world of, well, the Holritzes, the Holritz family and Nathan. I was the oldest. I have three younger brothers, Jason, Joshua, and Jeremy. And uh, we didn't live in Kokomo for very long, ended up moving to Japan when I was about uh, two years old. Oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've heard this story. I listened to those recordings I like used used to listen to them all the time on my own iPod when I was younger. They were Just, that entertaining. Yeah, I mean, honestly, they were. Um, but yeah. It's... All right, fair enough. All right, that was the first question. We're doing well. All right, let's jump to the second question. This is the most important one, actually. Why do you always wear black V-neck shirts? And <laughs> we'll get to the most important second half. Okay, um, this is a great question. I think this actually came from Jason, and it is a question that gets posed to me occasionally. I do wear the same thing all the time, uh, and my son is laughing at me because he is quite the creative dresser himself and not wearing the same thing all the time. I actually started wearing black shirts largely because I sweat really easy. It's kind of an embarrassing reason, but I'd get up on stage and I'd speak. Like If I look back to video or pictures of speaking on stage in the photo industry back in the day, I mean, you could see, you know, sweat stain, and I wanted to avoid that embarrassment, so I wore, I chose a dark shirt, and then, a little bit selfishly, I guess, uh, I lost a bunch of weight. I used to weigh close to 240 pounds. Oh, I did not uh, know that. Did you not? I didn't know it was that much. You didn't yeah. remember that I was that I was that big? Well, 240 pounds. So I lost. Uh, I'm down probably about uh, 50 pounds or so from there, but. Once I lost all that weight and I kind of leaned out and got my body where I wanted it to be, I was I was proud of it. So I wanted to, not only did I wear the black black color, but mm -hmm. a bit of a fitted black t-shirt. So that's those are the reasons. And then, you know, honestly, it really is simple to just have to throw a bunch of black t-shirts and a couple pair of jeans yeah. in my suitcase and travel. It makes life a lot easier. Sounds easier. Yeah, a lot less moving parts to yeah. think about. Uh, and the second half... Are you Wolverine? <laughs> I love this question. Thanks, Jason, for that. Um, I don't know. You tell me. You're the you're the superhero. Um, should we say fanatic or at least expert? Sure. I mean, we could go with either. That's okay. Both sound accurate. Um, I mean, the beard fits. The beard. Mostly, yeah. The spiky hair, maybe. Uh, no. No. You're too tall. So. Oh really? Wolverine's like five five. Whoa. Five, six. Oh, in yeah. the comic books, the comic yeah. book Wolverine. Hugh okay. Jackman's definitely taller. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, and this is a little bit more uh, intense. A little more question. serious. <laughs> we jump from Wolverine to <laughs> how would uh, you define true success? Hmm. I think I could go different directions with the answer to this question, but certainly one of the ways that I would define success for me personally would be if I live up to my value set. We talked a little bit about values and the idea right. of values before. Yeah. I have a list of values. I'm a bit of a dork like that. I make lists of things. <laughs> but I have a list of values. I sat, some, sat down and took some time to come up with this list some time ago and kind of developed it even a little bit over time. But I'll just read them off to you. And, and I would say very simply that I'm successful or I'll feel successful if I consistently live out this value set throughout my life. And uh, there are seven of them here. I'll just read them off really quickly and then also the definition that I've written to go along with them. The first is healthy. And next to that, I put anytime I take care of my body in a way that helps me stay lean and feeling alert and energetic. Food is fuel and sleep is king. And I think that pretty much speaks for itself. I will be a little bit transparent. When I, when I say food is fuel, I've used food too much in my life as kind of a, an emotional crutch. Uh, and I know it's something that a lot of people struggle with, but I try to, I, I want to to use food as a fuel source to help myself feel good, to feel healthy. And of course, also simultaneously enjoy the, the taste of it, but I just don't want to put so much priority on that that I get carried away with it and, I'm, and I become reliant on it. Uh, 
So healthy and then kind. Anytime I've been able to show someone kindness in word or deed, particularly through empathy. And then proactive is the next one. Anytime I'm moving forward or thinking ahead. I don't want to get stuck too too often in, or really at all, but certainly not too often in, in mistakes uh, or even too much processing. It's so easy to overthink things. I know personally it is for me, and uh, I don't want to get stuck too often. I want to continue to move forward. That's really important to me. Growing, anytime I've learned something new, always asking how and why. We've talked about this a lot, and you guys, you and Addie both do this really, really well. It, Certainly, you have a curiosity to learn more, but you ask why. And I've encouraged you to ask why. And I think that's really important. So growing, I'm particularly fulfilled when I'm growing. Connected, anytime I've been able to engage with someone on an emotional level. And then I also put consistent connection with a community of people. The first piece, when I say engage with someone on an emotional level, uh, I'm not a huge fan. Actually, I shouldn't say I'm, I'm not even, it's not that I'm not a fan of surface level conversation. I'm not good at it. Where I am comfortable is going deeper in a conversation, delving into what drives a person psychologically. Um, I want to know their feelings about a particular topic. You're, you're smirking. It's a little bit difficult to uh, you know, go up to someone and be like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Yeah. What's your name? Oh, okay, cool. What drives you psychologically? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair point. I've essentially done that uh, mm -hmm. in the past. And yeah, it's, it probably makes people a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I usually save those kinds of conversations for like late at night and where all the lights are off and we're really tired. But Okay, okay. I do enjoy those kinds of conversations too, definitely. I, I would personally, you're not quite there yet. I'd personally throw in probably a glass of wine or two. <laughs> not yeah. quite yet. Yeah, but that, that works. Um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough point though. You can't just do that with anybody all the time. A consistent connection with the community of people. I, I thrive in this. And it doesn't have to be a large community, a really tight-knit group of friends. You've done this really well. You've got a really tight-knit group of friends that, that you spend time with regularly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to hang out soon again, actually. Most of them are in marching band as well, which means that we get to stick together. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, For a span of three or four years or so there, I was too disconnected. Um, from community, both personally and professionally. And I'm really trying to get back out there and connect with people now. Certainly feel incredible in that realm. And then, or when I'm in that realm, simple is the next value. Uh, anytime I've been able to reduce an idea or process to its absolute minimum and most important parts. And then I also added to that the 80-20 principle or 80-20 rule. I would love simplicity. I love the notion of simplicity. I've come to better uh, understand and certainly accept the idea that not everything is simple. Uh, but I think that we also as a culture have a tendency to overcomplicate things, both in our personal lives and professional lives. I love to simplify, uh, particularly business, take out the unnecessary moving parts. And as entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, one of the benefits, and I, and I say this all the time, but one of the benefits or potential benefits is having a lot of free time. I want more free time that I can hang out with you and Addie. Mm -hmm. But if I've got all these moving parts of my business, unnecessary moving, moving parts of my business, I'm going to end up wasting time. And along with that, then, the parts that I do want in my business and in my personal life, I want to have the most impact. So the, the idea there with the 80-20 principle is 20% of the moving parts make 80% of the difference or drive 80% of the growth. And uh, I like to, to try to live by that. And then the last item on the list, and we'll move to the next question consistency. Uh, and I put next to that, anytime I've been consistent in my values and or emotional state. This is something as an emotional person that I've, uh, I'm, I have to actively work on developing my consistency emotionally, my consistency in the way that I run my business, uh, consistency in the way that I engage with, with other people. I can easily kind of jump on that roller coaster and be yeah. up and down. Can you you say yeah? What, can you relate to that? Oh yeah, I mean I have, I have a difficult time keeping things consistent, even in like my daily schedule, which I, I try to keep consistent every day. But combination of weird school times and things like that make it a little bit difficult. You have a daily schedule as a fourteen year old. What does yeah. what does that mean? <laughs> what does that look? Well, like? I mean I I generally come home and do homework if I have that. Chill out for a few minutes. Uh, practice saxophone. Uh, work out. Uh, do my daily ritual, maybe after I take a shower. And, What's your daily ritual? Uh, I usually meditate, write down 10 ideas, which is an idea that you told me about, which just inspires uh, creative thinking. And 
write down 10, I, I do this list called the overly specific gratitude list. Mm. And it's just a list of 10 things that I write down every day that are just really specific things that make me happy or that I'm thankful for. And then after that, I'll generally uh, write for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then right after that, I'll do something depending on what day of the week it is. And that's just weekdays. Weekends are the whole other I love that that's just weekdays. <laughs> really, this interview, we should be interviewing you. You can share inspiring <laughs> daily behaviors that, that probably a lot of us can take a cue from. That's awesome. That's thanks, really cool. Thanks. And you're you have a workout regimen too that's like forty minutes long, right? Forty minutes long. The the half workout that I do on the weekdays is about half an hour long if I am doing it uh, without a lot of breaks in between. And then on the weekends, it's it takes a little bit longer to do, just a little bit more effort. But... Because you want to look as good as me. <laughs> okay. Yep, that's exactly. Okay. It. Okay. Good. Just just checking. All right. Well, we got on a tangent there, but I think it was a great tangent. Really, I think we're going to, this is just going to become an Austin or interview of Austin. Uh, let's see. And we've, we've answered what all of three questions so far. Okay. All right. Go ahead. What's the next one? All right. If you could have coffee and converse with anyone uh, living or not, who would it be and why? Again, lots of potential options there, but you know what? I would love to have had a conversation as an adult with my mom's dad my grandfather he was he passed away when i was i think about seven years old and um he was six six wow he married my my grandmother my mom's mom who is well less than less than five foot tall i think when they got married she was five foot or five foot one anyway i love the pictures of the two of them together because there's a significant height difference right it's very comical it's well, it, it is, but then it's beautiful too yeah. that you see these two drastically different people come together. Contrast is pretty in the end. Absolutely, I, I would, I would fully agree, fully agree. So he was, he actually passed away from uh, well, back let's see, back when I was in 1986, I believe, when I was seven years old. I have a few pictures of the two of us together. Um, I think maybe two or three pictures in my my kind of photo album from childhood. But I just never got a chance to really engage him in conversation as somebody was a bit more self-aware as an adult, ideally. And so I think that would be the person I'd love to sit down with. You know, and he was so incredible on his, literally on his deathbed. He's, he's in the hospital um, not long before he passed away. And he's, on, he's in the classified ads going through trying to find a car for a missionary family that had come back to the States. Like that was the kind of person that, that he was. Yeah. And uh, so I'd, I'd love to have gotten to know someone with his heart and also somebody who who was a match for my grandmother who's extremely feisty. You've had a chance to spend a little bit of time with her, oh, but yeah. she's she's in her 80s and, and goes on, you know, five mile hikes and, and has season tickets to the Mariners. And, yeah. and I mean, it's just an incredible person. Uh, it'd be it'd be awesome just to get to know someone who she picked as a partner, yeah. too. You know, I think yeah. that'd be kind of cool. All right. Um. Uh, what would be your, oh, sorry. What was your favorite memory of childhood from when you were growing up? Another question with a lot of potential answers, because I, I can think back to a lot of really cool memories uh, as a kid. Actually, you know what? We should, we should totally throw in a clip right here. Another audio clip, another tape recording. My dad used to do these productions at Christmas. Do you remember hearing these where like oh, you yeah. have the intro music? And oh, then we really introduce ourselves. Too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, prepare yourself for a gem. I'm going to throw this quick uh, intro clip to our Christmas production. We used to send these tapes to uh, my grandparents back in the States. So we'd be in Japan. This was a way to connect with them because, of course, we didn't have Skype. And making a phone call was ridiculously expensive at the time from Japan back to the States. We would make these tapes and we'd send tapes back to the States. So this is a clip from Christmas one year. I think maybe he even says the year. It's very official. Uh, and, uh, well, just listen it. Hey, 
And a very Merry Christmas to you from the Holritz family in Japan. From Nathan. Christmas on my From Jason. Christmas on my And from Paul and Kathy. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. All right, I, I don't even know how to what to say as a follow-up to that, but... <laughs> There you go. That if that would certainly be a favorite memory of childhood. All these audio recordings. It's a lot of fun to listen back on it. But I would say that I'm particularly thankful for all the opportunity that I had to travel. We, because of my parents' work, we traveled a lot here in the states. I've been through probably every state except for Alaska and Hawaii. And next month, what are we doing? Hawaii again? Not again. Well, really? you said Hawaii. You oh no. Yeah. No. What? No. I haven't. I haven't been to Hawaii or to Alaska yet. So. Oh, okay, okay. We're going to go to Hawaii next month. Yes. You, the three of us, you, myself, mm -hmm. and, of course, Addison. Um, we take, I take the kids on a big trip every year, and this is going to be our big trip this year. We're going to Hawaii, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Alaska, hopefully sometime. That was another option we had talked I'd about. I'd love to go to Alaska, yeah. So, uh, but we, we got to travel stateside a great deal, see various really well-known sites, and then, of course, time in Japan, Canada, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, and I've traveled more since then. But the opportunity to be able to travel to see all these sites as a kid, to be exposed to a different culture, different food, language, people, incredible experience. And I'm really, really thankful for that. That's one of my favorite memories. Uh, and this is something that I'm probably going to, to need the advice for soon since we're getting to high school, but how do you keep from being overwhelmed? Hmm. These days, I love getting out and riding the motorcycle. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah that and it, it's extremely meditative. I, I would say meditation is another, another realm that I've explored that is extremely centering and relaxing. Mm -hmm. But riding a motorcycle has been a form of meditation for me. It's, you're so engaged in the process, you know, every appendage engaged in some way and, and riding this motorcycle, shifting and braking and, um, of course, you're paying it. You got to pay attention to everything that's going on around you, and there's some danger to it, which is very exciting. But that that is an outlet for me, I guess, to to keep from being overwhelmed. The other the other piece, I guess, more technically, more practically, is learning to take one thing at a time. Or if, if I'm going to make a task list for the day, ideally, no more than three or four kind of primary objectives for the day. And I don't because if, if I'm looking at a, a list of ten things to do for the day, already it seems overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. If I only focus on the top two or three, top three or four most important objectives for the day, less overwhelming. I can focus on those, check them off, get them done, feel good about it. So that's a bit more practical method. That makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, how did you get started in business? This thing that has brought you here to recording this podcast. Ah, well. And this is also applicable to you because you're getting ready to start yeah. a business. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so we're planning on starting my own freelance writing company. Not exactly sure in what area yet or any of the major details, but that's the, the basic idea of what we've got going so far. Yeah. And you, you were not fully on board with this, I don't think, the other day when we were talking about this. There was a little bit of apprehension. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like a lot of work, like a lot of work. Uh, especially at this point. Um, but I, I'm interested to see where it's going to go. Well, and a lot of the thought process from my end was you didn't seem to be too challenged in school, mm -hmm. and you spoke to that multiple times. And we had already talked about the possibility, I think, in the past of when you turn 15, 16 years old, time to get a job. Instead of going out and just grabbing a retail job, you start a business. But because you weren't being challenged in school now, I thought, well, what better way to teach you some practical lessons that are applicable to multiple areas in life, even if you don't go on to continue to, to run this business or run any type of business. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are concepts, principles that, you, that are certainly applicable to life, um, much more so in some cases than a lot of the stuff that you're even going to learn in school. And so I wanted to be able to challenge you with practical information. And you've, you're an extremely talented writer, so this will be a really cool outlet for you to, to exercise that in a business format, yeah. which is great. I'm, I am excited for that portion of it. It's a lot more practice. So. Cool. How I got started in business, wow, it was, it was almost random, really. Mm -hmm. So back when, 
let's see, I'm trying to think. This was 2000, even, even before that, I guess about 2000, when your mom and I got married. We got this inexpensive film camera. And we like to take pictures with it. I think I ended up taking more pictures with it than uh, than Amber did. But Amber ended up putting together a portfolio of images that I had taken. Uh, somebody saw that portfolio, and then they recommended me to their friends to shoot their wedding, and I had an opportunity. So for three hundred and fifty dollars, and at the time, three hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> It didn't even really cover the the, the processing, the film processing mm-hmm. cost, right? Because I think we shot like 10 or 11 rolls of film. Oh, wow. But 350 bucks, shoot the first wedding. And fortunately, it ended up turning out okay. And within the first year and a half or so, we shot, and I say we because your mom and I ended up shooting together, obviously, mm-hmm. but a uh, year and a half or so, we shot about 15 weddings. And then the next year, we shot, the next full year, we shot 30. Oh, wow. So the business jumped really, really quickly, yeah. and it just kind of took off from there. I actually didn't know that story, I don't think, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and I may have told you before, I was kind of going down a different path as far as my career. My parents had been involved in ministry, and that was kind of the direction that I was going, and I think a lot of that had to do with feeling like I was expected to do that, um, or at least some pressure in that realm. So I branched off and did something totally different than what my parents were involved in, and um, ultimately, it, it panned out. It worked out for the for the good. That's great. That's great. What advice would you give to someone still working their way up to uh, full time in the business? Great question. I would break that into two different parts. So, first of all, capitalize on the opportunity that you have right now, the flexibility that you have. Assuming that you're you know you're part time, let's say you're a part time photographer, but you still have your full time job. You've got a regular income. You're not reliant on the income from your photography, so you can be really particular in the client or potential clients that you go after. Photographers who are relying solely on their photography income, the income from their photography business to make a living, in some cases, at least when they're starting out, they don't have a ton of business, they're kind of freaking out. They're just trying to get as much business as they possibly can, right? And, and because of that, they're not, they don't have as much freedom to focus on a really specific client base. So I would say take advantage of the opportunity when you still have a second income, and hopefully it's a full-time income, where you don't have to worry so much about the money from the photography business and really build a client base that you truly get excited about, that you really want to go after. Specialize, pick that, that client segment and go after them. Um, and then the second piece I would say is spend a lot of time or as much time as possible connecting with people, especially in wedding photography. What really drove our business as we continued to grow was the relationship that we had with a particular wedding coordinator in town. She would, she would literally come and sit in our office and sell our work to the client. I, I, could, awesome. I could sit there and I would listen to her and she would just talk. I wouldn't have to do anything. Yeah. So that kind of relationship is really important. And if you can have two or three or four of those really tight relationships with people in your community, uh, whatever type of photography that you do, that that could ultimately translate to building your business. And so relationships, I mean, regardless of whatever field you may be in, relationships are absolutely vital, but I would say it makes a big difference in building a, a full-time business. That makes sense. I know how well you have taken care of this question, but how do you balance work and family? Well, I want to... And you don't have to, to kiss up or anything oh, no, here. I'm, 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 I'm actually, let's, we're having a real conversation. We're going to let the world hear it. But, but talk to me about your perspective on that. Oh, no, I think you do. I, you do awesome with this. You, I mean, you do work a decent amount, but when it comes down to it, you, you spend a lot of time with us and do a lot of cool stuff with us too. I mean, we're going to Hawaii in a few weeks. So that's pretty exciting, right? Yeah, yeah there is, you know, ultimately I, I created Photographer's Edit, my current company, to give me more freedom and flexibility to spend time, but largely to spend time with you guys. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the th- part of the thought process in that was to kind of create a system that ran itself, that didn't require me to be involved all the time. And I took advantage of that for quite a while. As of late, and you've seen this, I've been going 100 miles an hour, a, a lot more time in the business, mm-hmm. um, trying to connect with the industry, creating content. But very simply, I like many things in life, actually, it's just a matter of making a choice, right? Creating, in this case, when, it, when we're talking about separating work and, and family life, creating a cutoff point. 
and I don't, I used to have a bit more strict guideline for myself, you know, at this particular time I do this and mm -hmm. this particular time I do that. And, and I like to, to be a little bit more free and fluid now, but cutting off work at a certain time, usually I'll make dinner for you guys and um, might even have the chance to connect as, as I'm making dinner. Addison likes to come make dinner with me sometimes. Yeah. Um, we'll connect in conversation over dinner. We might, um, we, we like to watch movies together. Uh, or a documentary or a show, and we'll have conversation about that. Um, what, what else is something that we do? We, we like to play Xbox together. Yeah, because we're huge nerds. <laughs> yeah, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess a 37-year-old playing Xbox is pretty nerdy, though. Just a little. Uh, we'll go to the pool together. Weekends, we usually try to do something. Mm -hmm. So I think we, I don't know. I, yeah. I think we mix it up a good, I agree. pretty I well. I agree, yeah. yeah. We did rock climbing for a little while there. Yeah, we we kind of go through phases, don't yeah, we? Definitely. We we do things in segments. What was what was before rock climbing? What else did we do? Um, I don't know. I mean, back, way way back when there was always the aquarium and the Creative Discovery Museum <laughs> that we hit over and over oh, again. Yeah. yeah, never got bored. And we've kind of we've begun to dabble in things like we we bought some models. Yeah, that haven't been completed. Yeah, a little, a little bit on the back burner there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we. You got me a, a Lego for my birthday, which was really cool. We were building that together last night. We, the three of us sitting at the table and building this big Lego together. That was fun. It's a little bit difficult for, as a team effort to build a Lego, but it is fun. It is. It is. Well, it, I think largely because it just means we're sitting at, at the table and it's opportunity for conversation. Yeah, definitely. You're doing something with your hands, but you can talk all the while. I think that was a lot. I, I really enjoyed that, that part of it. Me too. All right, so for the sake of the listeners, I mean, we, we could talk for a long time, but we have to kind of wind this down. We're coming up on, I think, that 30, 35-minute mark. Um, I'm going to let you pick the last question. We've got like one, two, three, four questions left here. I'll pick the one that, that stands out to you. Um, I'm going to have to go with, so who would you say has uh, been the most influential person in your life, either in business or just life in general, and why was it that they were so influential? Wow. Well, I would I would say particularly the last three or four years, and I think I alluded to this earlier. There's it has been a transition time, and I've been kind of growing up. I really I've been doing what I hope you and Addie do in your twenties, early twenties anyway, kind of figuring life out and how you want to approach life and what certain things mean to you. Uh, I've been doing a lot of that, and what has helped me a lot in that processing is uh, the work of Tony Robbins. He wrote a book called Awaken the Giant Within. It's kind of a cheesy title, but the information in that book has been just transforming. And I know that we've had multiple conversations about the content or certain content in his writing, but so I, I would have to say Tony Robbins. But you know what? I mean, as we're sitting here thinking about or talking about this too, I would say that you and Addie have been certainly, and, and in all seriousness, mm -hmm. Uh, and for those of you who can't see, Austin's kind of grinning and, and laughing. You can hear him in the background. I, mean, I thought he was going to say Steve Jobs at first. So. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, this is a very long story, but to put it just very simply, I mean, you've talked about Steve Jobs a lot in the past and his work ethic and stuff like that. But when I was much younger, I thought you guys were like, a, I thought you guys owned part of Apple <laughs> like, because you, you you owned Apple products. So I, I thought that you guys worked there or something. Like, really, <laughs> that's I'm awesome. Sure about that. I love that we're both learning things about each other that we didn't know. That's awesome. Yeah. That's funny. Um, no, but seriously, I, the experience, the process of being a dad um, has been extremely transformational. And for me, it's, and it's a, it's still a constant effort, but it's an effort at being open to seeing my faults as a result of my interaction with you guys. Um, sometimes I'm lucky enough to see that on my own without you necessarily saying, saying something about it. But then we also have a pretty open line of communication, and sometimes you give me feedback, uh, or you might call me out on something that, that I've done or I've said, and it's an opportunity for me to kind of rethink how I approach the conversation or how I approach a particular topic or issue in life. Um, so you guys have been significantly impactful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And on that note, on that note, anything you'd like to add to the conversation here at the end? Uh, I don't think so. I'm, I'm disappointed that you guys still never worked at Apple, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, if only, I, if I only I owned even a fraction of that stock. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you guys for listening in today on this uh, bit of a twist 
in the Boca podcast. This has been Nathan Holritz and Austin Holritz. Thank you for interviewing me today. No problem. I loved it. It was really fun. And thank you guys for, for those of you who submitted questions. Uh, that was a huge help. Looking forward to having these types of conversations with you, hopefully in person in the near future. And uh, of course, you can also look forward to the next interview, photographer interview coming up a week from today. Uh, you can look for these episodes. We're going to try to post, I'll try to post them uh, once a week, every Thursday. Go to photographersedit.com slash blog and you uh, can see those episodes there or you can go to iTunes and subscribe to the Boca podcast. Talk with you more soon. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast. If you'd like to hear a particular photographer or entrepreneur in a future episode, don't hesitate to email me, nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom post-production for the wedding and portrait photographer. 